also somewhat nervous that a group of so many eminent scientists should decide in a moment of thoughtlessness to tolerate me. I am grateful, Professor Wagmare. It is a great honor for me. Professor Wagmare wrote to me saying that I should speak on language diversity and that is a subject dear to me, close to my heart. But I thought since I have this opportunity of addressing scientists, I should say something more than just about the diversity being there and say something about the future of this diversity. I know that perhaps I am not going along the track Professor Vagmar expected me to go. Uh, I am aware that I am not saying this evening that diversity is very crucial for the maintenance of democracy and diversity dwindling is democracy collapsing. But I will uh, avoid that temptation and uh, just focus on the idea of language is emergence and its future and how memory has impacted the course of recent course of the existence of languages, how a certain kind of aphasia is set in globally, not just in India, but globally. Now, this uh, topic that I have chosen, language, memory and aphasia, uh, invites me to cover a very large field in terms of temporal span, history, as well as the number of languages that the world has. The world has 7000 languages uh, around. And since it is a large picture that I am presenting, you will please forgive me if I do only a broad brush picture of what is before me. Thank you once again for asking me to be here on the 23rd uh, occasion and I wish this organization lasts. Many organizations are showing weak knees and uh, uh, weak spine bone. <coughs> I hope this survives for a very long time because scientific temper is essential as a pillar of democracy, of a modern democracy, of a modern nation. And you are doing that wonderful work. I want to thank all of you and here I go. When I was a child, I normally thought that language has been there because my parents spoke and their parents spoke and everybody around me spoke. And I thought just as air is there and water is there, language is there. The question as to when it began had not occurred to me when I started looking at languages which were dying and untimely death and there were many that I saw dying. The question came to my mind as to when did humans actually begin using language and that took me back to a very long time in prehistory, the uh, homonyms, the homo sapiens, let me s stick to that rather than uh, uh, started moving out of the original habitat and that movement would not have been possible unless they had acquired language because language became a weapon for them. The eyes can see sometimes even long distance, but the eyes cannot see what is at the back of your head. Language can, language because it has flexibility can capture things, name things. For instance, I can look to the sky and say well that is Venus and that is Mars. I can name things long distance even if I cannot grasp them, even if they are outside immediate physical experience except the experience coming through sight. That flexibility was weaponized 
but acquisition of language as language not just the skill to shout, yell, whimper, moan, I mean that is primary, even that would have taken several lakhs of years, but language as a structure of meaning as a sentence if you like to call it uh, probably belongs to a date that can be put 70,000 years before our time. Which were the languages they spoke? Do you have any idea? Uh, someday we will have that idea because just now uh, all these signatures every time a word is used either in spoken form or in a nascent form the word leaves a little signature just as a bullet leaves a signature on the barrel of a gun the word does but 85, 85 billion neurons you know the number of neurons I do not know it uh, uh, probably science will have to develop quite a lot before finding out all the historical signatures that language has left on the human brain uh, in the course of its evolution. So, we do not know the names of those languages, those languages were not named. Languages started acquiring names only when people met some other people and in order to create other people, people first had to move out, settle, flourish, face all those glacials or interglacials and all the names, great names archaeologists have given to those ecological periods. But certainly uh, around the time of the Holocene, languages were in existence and I am bringing you closer to our time. I am just talking of about 10,000 years before Christ, uh, about 12,000 years before our time, languages existed. Uh, there are of course, uh, clear signs if you go to Madhya Pradesh, Bhimbetka, you notice that humans were expressing themselves. The recursive brain had started functioning long time back and had acquired ability to control great amount of complexity of transaction of meaning. And the recursive brain I do not have to state it for you is unlike other animals who have brains two, uh, perhaps they have better brains than us, I do not know, uh, because they have not fought wars the way humans have fought wars. Uh, they do think, but thinking about thought is peculiarly ours and that is what the recursive brain does. Uh, having language is a sign of this recursive brain is functioning. 12,000 years ago, people spoke, they had spread out into Asia, Western Asia certainly, also in South India, South Asia and uh, in Australia, uh, up in the north in Europe, in the areas that we call the Slavic areas and so on. And there would be many other dispersals of human population at that time, but they lived together and they use languages. All that we know about language, language history uh, goes back to the uh, aeroglyphs in Egypt or if it is a written document where words are preserved, maybe the uh, uh, Zoroaster, Armenic or uh, the Vedic uh, Sanskrit. There was a common belief in Europe in the 19th century and 18th century that all languages came from a single language and that idea which was uh, ori uh, oriented towards uh, Christian theology uh, because of original parents and then splitting family that has been long back discarded and uh, we now know that languages emerge differently at different depending on the uh, climate, the ecological conditions, uh, the uh, possibilities or compulsions of movements and so on. So, there would be many languages all over the world, even 10,000 years before our time. There is a principle in linguistics called the language knot or the population knot. That is, if there is enough number of people to allow those people not to migrate outside that area, they tend to stay there. 
and that allows a certain language to develop in its own way and those who have moved further develop another language in a different way. Therefore, languages, many languages were there. Much closer to our time say 2000 or 3000 years before, 2500 years before our time, if Gautam Buddha was speaking Pali, Mahavir was speaking a Prakrut and those who were chanting the Upanishads or compiling the Upanishads, extracting things from the Vedas were speaking one form of Sanskrit. In the south, there would be a proto Dravidian or an early form of Tamil and the, uh, the, the Prakruts were not just one Prakrut, there was a Maharashtra Prakrut, there, there was Eastern Prakrut, Saurseni and so on. Many languages were there in existence all through our history. If I bring you further down the you know uh, history and closer to even uh, uh, more close to our time 20th century that is the last century. Uh, in 1961 census, I had noticed a list of 1652 mother tongues, 1652 mother tongues in 1971 census. With the, the census is carried out uniformly with the same errors every 10 years and that helps actually because then you have something comparable. So, the runner's data uh, over a time sequence with consistency is not too bad. Uh, I mean, uh, now we even do not have that data. That is so, uh, in 71, 1652 had become 109, 1500 and more languages where names were wiped out of uh, our national record, national memory. 109 names were there, 108 were names of languages, the 109th name was all others. That intrigued me quite a lot and I spent nearly two decades to figure out what were these all others. There is a different story another day. Language diversity is under some kind of assault. Now, so often my linguistics friends in linguistics, linguist friends say it is because of globalization. Yes, of course. It is because of policy neglect, wrong policies, yes of course. It is because parents are moving their kids from their local languages to English, yes of course. But these are only superficial reasons for language loss. Because earlier too, similar kind of challenges were faced by languages. I am not saying the same challenges, but there were other challenges which were overpowering, overwhelming challenges and languages had survived something deeper, something more fundamental appears to have changed. I mentioned that there are 7000 languages in the world, that is what ethnologue which has been maintaining a record of languages globally over the last 70 years says uh, UNESCO initially said there are 5000, then looking up to ethnologue UNESCO started saying 7000, uh, then UNESCO's language, uh, uh, endangered languages salvation program became financially very successful, it received great funding. So, UNESCO's now pegged up the figure to 8000 languages, no matter, I mean there are thousands of languages. Of these thousands, it appears that about 4 thousand languages will simply disappear in the next 30 years. There is a method of assessing as to for how long a language may live. In Europe, they have started declaring dead languages or languages which are soon to die uh, by giving them a digital life identity. If a language has not entered digital world, then in Europe it is declared as a potentially dead language. Now, this I like the phrase potentially dead <laughs> because, because it is a very useful sociological description. Uh, languages dying 
has become a worry globally from 2000 onwards. So many atlases of dead languages or dying languages have appeared and 2010 onwards a new phenomenon is noticed. There are about 80 new institutions which are declared as language museums. There were no language museums before, before 2010. I tried to create one in a small village called language forest where every tree speaks a different language, Bhasha one I created and I thought I was you know I, I was I qualified for a Guinness book or patent or suddenly I saw that there was an epidemic. Now this desire to create museum of language also on its flip side shows a clear certification of ready readiness to die that languages are the fear of languages disappearing is is written is writ large uh, in uh, all humanities all linguistics all policy makers and so on i said there could be a fundamental reason and i will try this evening to explore what that reason could be and for exploring that i had to tell you two little stories the first story is about the relationship between shadow and substance. If I go back to the Greek, you know, uh, uh, pre-Christian Greek philosophy, uh, get, get, get into the uh, works of writings of uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, I notice that this enigmatic relationship between substance and its uh, uh, shadow, uh, which just cannot be dissociated. Plato was so scared, he describes a cave man who is lived inside a cave, one day walks you know to the mouth of the cave and because there is the sun outside, sees his own uh, long shadow falling there and gets completely scared. The entire uh, foundation of fields of knowledge, Greek fields of knowledge, whether it was aesthetics or medicine whether it was law or ethics, whether it was architecture or mathematics, all of that was trying to figure out how to dissociate the shadow from the substance, how to look at substance which is pure substance and therefore in fact they imagined the cosmos in the form of uh, this is rather funny for us in the 21st century, but for them this was a this was scientifically uh, valid they looked at the cosmos as a kind of a box like this room, like this hall uh, with the lead above with perforations, holes there and through those perforations at night light percolated the stars, what we think are the stars they thought were cavities. They also imagined a uh, another uh, level uh, under the, uh, uh, the floor which was perpetually dark because no light ever emanated from that and so they imagine there is a world full of light, world full of darkness and we are in between in the crossfire of light and darkness and therefore the shadow can never be dissociated because from our bodies. This story was not just there in Greece, it was probably there in Egypt too. Uh, the way the pyramids were structured, it was certainly there in our own country. The ancient philosophers in our own country were trying to say that what you think is substance is a mere shadow, it is Maya, Maya, it is illusion, it is Leela, it is I mean it is a play of illusions and to, to set aside this Maya and to look at things as they are in their pure lightness entirely lit up absolute and that would be like Virat Rup Darshan that the Gita describes. This was a scientific inquiry for the ancient world and it continued, it continued through the middle ages 
the ideas of God and divinity change, the ideas of cosmos change, the idea of the earth you know, and its relationship with other planets change. Uh, yet, the something that is outside this world, that idea which has relation, which something outside this world impacting our life continued. Our obsession for getting into a shadowless space has now caught up with us in contemporary times. I will arrive at that conclusion after telling you another one more story and there I had to invoke the term memory. Uh, I know that the body has a greater intelligence than the human intelligence that the body actually the genes actually know the body I mean what I, I do not know what the body means, but it uh, uh, and what we call knowledge is an after statement of that experience much delayed statement of that experience I know that. Knowledge as it came to an individual when we were not a society, but a bunch of individuals. Knowledge as it came to ind an individual was through sensory perception which became cognition, but knowledge that an individual acquired was shared with another individual for verification or for countering or just for just for sharing for a socializing purpose acquired an independent existence outside the brain of this individual or the other individual and that objective I am not using the term in uh, a Jungian sense not in the you know, sense this you know, uh, academic psychology uses this was some kind of collected memory. I am not talking of the collective memory, collected memory, neither yours nor mine, but to which both of us relate. When this is transacted, transferred to the next generation, the intergenerational transaction makes this memory more crowded and it then starts calling for a principle of organizing that memory. Actually, all the libraries in the world, all the museums in the world, all the universities in the world, all the schools in the world are engaged in doing that, classifying the human experience of matter, of motion, of invisible things, of sens sensations and uh, whatever you like. In the initial phase of this classification of memory, mnemonics was used, simple tricks. When I studied in my school days the colors of rainbow, we use the first letter of the names of colors. I mean you know the, 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 tamda, nila, piula, sa, na, hi, ni, pa, za, whatever jamblas. Uh, simple tricks, mnemonics, tricks of memory were are used. And we know that in uh, if, a, if a Lilavati was learning maths from her father, Actually, in the in a simple shloka, about ten or twelve letters, several formulas, uh, principles of maths could be contained. This was so with Europeans also. This was so with the Romans, the Lat Latinate scholars, the Greek scholars, and scholars, the Slavic scholars, everywhere in the world, because this was a sociological need. But when the knowledge load becomes more complex the classification becomes more challenging and a time came some 6, 7, 8 centuries before our time when different segments of knowledge were getting organized differently. Supposing it is chemistry, there is one kind of table, I think it is called periodic table. If it is maths, it is a different kind of notation. If it is geography or, geo or geology, it is yet a different kind of uh, for botany, it is yet another kind of classification. So, scholars were wondering as to how to bring these classifications together, so that the information becomes accessible, that knowledge becomes as accessible to all. So, there was say uh, late medieval uh, thinkers in Europe like Bruno or Lula 
or Leibniz who, who uh, actually managed to crack this question. Uh, they really struggle with this and they spent entire life as to how to bring different classifications together, how to bring different classifications of collected memory together. And finally, Leibniz uh, said, look you need a higher degree abstraction, higher order abstraction. So, do not have a classification you know in terms of tables and just think of purely abstract entities such as 0 or 1 and put them in strings and then you will be able to uh, link all these tables, classifications, taxonomies to that kind of higher abstraction. It worked, it worked. Actually, after that time, anybody who was keen to get access to knowledge was enabled to get access because of this kind of new classification. We use the term university and the term university does not mean university has knowledge about the entire universe. It only means university is a place which teaches a method which allows universal access to whatever knowledge deposit is there. That is all about it and that is why we call it universal knowledge. It is not that we learn in universities. Memory was abstracted, taken to a higher level abstraction and that also gave, created a possibility of creating an abstract memory, not natural memory but an abstract memory and we all know that that principle is being used in creation of what we call artificial memory. The artificial memory was extremely useful for us. It is today dominating every walk of life to the extent that when I came to Bangalore when I was 18, I remember telephone numbers of at least 20 friends, even strangers included remote uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, somebody you met on a just a train ride uh, accidentally. Today I do not have memory of my wife's telephone number because my artificial memory is keeping that. The artificial memory has replaced human memory in a big way. There was a time when students actually knew how to analyze chemicals in a lab. Today the artificial memory does it they can only analyze the results. This has impacted all walks of life. The artificial memory has started impacting language because the structure of memory is not, not AM, not artificial memory, not the art, artificial memory remember, is capable of remembering everything except the memory of its birth. It does not know who created it. I'm, the structure of memory is such that it becomes not art, not the structure of artificial memory, structure of natural memory, human memory. Uh, it becomes possible only if there is language because language helped humans to conceptualize time. I do not know if time exists or not, objectively speaking what use is my sense of time if I have to jump outside the earth and hang somewhere in between the Mars and the earth. But we all believe that time is there, we all go by that. And language created actually sentences which we call the past tense sentences. As if what the past was is actually with us, while it is in reality not with us. It is a matter of belief and also the future tense which simply is not there, but we visualize it and we like to believe that tomorrow we you know there might be a tomorrow and tomorrow uh, the Hindu copy of the Hindu, uh, I do not want to offend anybody's sentiments, the paper Hindu I am talking about, Hindu will arrive. <laughs> Time was conceptualized with the help of language and memory what we call human memory is actually framed within that concept of time. 
though memory runs amok, it plays it goes haywire, it does not have a linear structure. With all those caveats, human memory is founded on human sense of time, which in turn is founded on language. If the artificial memory comes in play, the human memory is sidelined and therefore, the need for human language gets minimized. Our obsession for looking at fully lit areas without shadows and our turning natural memory into a redundant acquisition of the mind together have propelled us towards the space that we can describe as the cyberspace. Today, reality in the cyberspace is considered more substantially real than the reality in what you and I used to say until yesterday the real space and time. I do not know how real that space and time those, those things were, but the cyberspace has become more real. Uh, go somewhere without your Aadhaar card, without that identity your existence is, but only the Aadhaar card can easily play the role of you know who you are. The digital identity, the di digital existence, cyber existence they are now become the and of course, they are now become uh, uh, very powerful all over the world and it is because of that, that humans no longer find language so necessary. Now, you will ask me what about communication? Language is necessary for communication, it has been necessary for communication all along, because in the first place we do not know if the consciousness we call what we call consciousness is there or it is a make believe thing and we just do not know if the phenomenal world exists out there or not. Yet, we know that there is a bridge between the two and that is language. The language helps us in connecting consciousness with the phenomenal world. Language is necessary for communication, a language is necessary for communication, but the communication that we are engaging in for the last 7, 6, 7 thousand years out of those 70 thousand years is a communication through representation such as writing. When you read a book, it is not the author who is speaking to you, but you think the book is a voice. We have now arrived at a higher level uh, abstraction or representation of speech. Uh, when I write an email, uh, uh, Professor Wagmare wrote several emails to me and I wrote several emails, we had not spoken a word. So, we were looking at shadows of sounds rather than sound itself the word is lost, meaning was conveyed, but the word is lost. The word is losing very rapidly, it is disappearing very rapidly. You will ask me in future in the cyberspace, in the digital communication and di digital communication is advantageous over communication through sound, because sound has its limitations, language is sound based. A sound can travel only, I mean I have failed in my first year science, <laughs> please forgive me. Sound can travel only so much, it, if I shout, you know, I, my sh shouting would not go to the moon at all, but digits can. Electronic, electromagnetic uh, signals can go outside the atmo at outside uh, uh, an area, uh, which can work as medium for sound. And therefore, perhaps humans are uh, expecting a new kind of communication uh, um, uh, communication protocol to come in. Language diminishing is observed as a fact. Language diminishing 
is propelled by the society that is obsessively drowning itself into cyberspace. Language diminishing is a certainty. If you look at languages themselves, today people use languages such as the English language, a large number, much larger number of people use the English language, but they use less English today. The spread in numbers is larger, but the count in numbers of words is much smaller. So, uh, even uh, language in so many layers is dead. For instance, metaphor cannot be understood. If I were to say something in a nice way about something very nice, for instance, uh, I was commenting, uh, please forgive me for this, that three presidents of the academy are Ram, Krishna and uh, uh, Shiva. This is a metaphor. I mean, it's a, it's not planned that way. Uh, that's what Ram told. <laughs> but, but it it would be lost unless it is explained. Unless it is explained that Partha is a name which is used in a certain manifestation of you know in in, in the Gita and you know so whatever. So metaphor not being understood has often caused in our time and in recent time friction. Because when you say something is so easily, it is first misunderstood and then it is understood. So many layers of meaning are lost. All those abhida, you know, all, all the uh, substratums, substrata of uh, meaning are uh, almost gone. Similarly, if you speak any of the Indian languages, you will have noticed that in your uh, childhood, there were things like proverbs, uh, they are gone. Dobi ka kutta, we do not understand, we actually na ghatka na gharka in Hindi. If you say this, somebody will say you are talking about a dog and not in Marathi mani and ukhane, they are completely gone. Riddles used to be there, completely gone. So many, so many uh, ornaments of language are dropping off. Language is becoming naked. Skeleton is scary. It's really scary. If it's painful, uh, even the carriers of language, uh, which is uh, you know, books, newspapers, television, they are not able to use language. Humans uh, in in your family, uh, people no longer speak they send whatsapp messages as to what would you prefer for dinner tonight my dear and then the answer is uh, yes i need a pizza my love no words we are now citizens of a continent called silence we all suffering from what a psychoanalyst or psychologist would call aphasia, loss of language. Aphasia is language, loss of language is aphasia. A professor of reading, the reading that is reading habits as sub branch of education in Britain did a study of children uh, and found that the, their brains are tired. The broca's lobe is no longer active as it was in the past, which analyzes language and arrives at abstractions and visual, vis, visuals attract the mind more, they excite the mind more. This professor also found out that possibly dyslexia, dyslectic children is going to be the order of the day in coming times. They are no longer able to write, you know, we used to write examination papers, long answers for civil services examination, the three page essay, then you become district collector <laughs> or ND examination. Now, of course, you can go Agnipath and you know, in, you do not have to write any examination, that is different. 
children are no longer able to read or write and i bet and pardon me for you know saying this uh, uh, my little gambling habit if you ask any of your colleagues if they have read really good books on science in the last few years mostly you will be disappointed people have stopped reading books reading speaking this fatigue in the brain this professor says that for the evolution to go ahead dyslectic children might be a possible link between homo sapiens now and the homo sapiens in future that is man when i say man humans but there is a problem with this human thing now i will come to that problem immediately and probably i will conclude what i to say humans in order to go ahead in the process of evolution seem to have entered a juncture where the advent of the intellect appears to have ended and where humans have given up the idea of going ahead and allowing this marathon to continue by handing the baton over to a new creature called cyborg that is half human half machine but you cannot call that machine half machine very soon there will be voting rights for those intelligent machines they should have they should have because voting rights depend on who contributes labor and if the drones are cleaning the floors today then they must be given the right to vote why not i am serious about it cyborgs the long journey we began 70000 years ago as stepping out of our animality animal hood and forming family society nations etc etc appears to have come to an end with at some kind of terminal point where i mean depending on how your politics is you will either become i mean call yourself homo deus or cyborgs homo deus is the term used by those who believe that this kind of future is de desirable for humans cyborg is a term used by people who think that something is wrong in going along this way let me add a few footnotes to these two views sometime in the 1860s late 1860 sorry 1960s pardon me forgive me 1960s a russian astronaut presented a definition for development and his definition was that uh, human migrations have always been towards source of energy and therefore if humans have limitless energy then they can be considered to be developed according to his definition today we have still not reached even phase 1 we will then go to phase 2 where we will be able to acquire energy from outside capture it from outside uh, and on the basis of this definition uh, i think a mathematician uh, dyson uh, proposed this idea of dyson shell uh, built possibly out of some kind of light rays uh, i don't uh, ultra ray or what your uh, above surrounding the earth which can be opened and close to capture all the energy that is coming from the sun or other stars to the earth uh, already tenders are out in canada to create such a shell around the earth and i am sure given the confidence with which science you know science works one day such a shell will emerge if that much energy is available then it will become possible for me to be speaking to you now here go for my dinner to mars and then come back for sleep in bangalore once again great motion can become possible if trillions of times of energy is available to us 
that is one view of human beings and their development. And those who believe that this is the path that humans have to take are thinking of turning us into homo deus. Deus is you know a Greek king or god, god king, Indra like figure. That is one vision of the future. The other vision of the future is and again thanks to scientific community, those who are interested in the earth, the planet earth and the resources that the earth has, they come to the conclusion that Holoc Holocene is over and Anthropocene has started. And we now, uh, all the tipping points, I think four or five years back, scientists got together in London and said the Anthropocene uh, sorry, has started. There may be debates about when it starts, whether it has started, it is yet to start, but we are all talking of it and we know in the hearts of heart of one's heart that the human footprint on the planet earth and its sources resources is now too too large and irreversible that the match between the available resource and what is expended what is spent will always go on widening like the you know nations uh, deficit financing goes on widening so. and perhaps we will be around then till only such a time as we can be around somehow we will have to hang on this kind of view is also held by many human beings particularly those who are in the margins those whose languages have disappeared, those who do not have much say in affairs of the world. Uh, one vision of the future is all light, no shadow. The other vision of the future is all darkness, no light. Between these two, the language loss is indicating whether we have to counter this darkness first or whether we have to jump into a race for gaining perpetual light. I think this uh, enigma of how to dissociate substance from shadow has brought us to this kind of dangerous turn. If we had stayed content with the substance and the shadow together, probably we would still have been speak a speaking animal, but today we are a s rapidly becoming a silent animal. We are at a war, we are declared a war with world and when the world is not there, humans will find that the world is not there because it is the world that has created the world for and I am not speaking metaphorically, I know metaphors are lost. I am literally saying because it is with the words that I can name the tree as tree, fish as fish, star as star, you as you, me as me. Without the word, there is a Bangla, there is a Bangla uh, song I think, Awak Prutvi Awak, speechless earth is a terrifying sight. Language, memory, aphasia. We began mobilizing ourselves, socializing, building societies. We began, started building knowledge. Now we are beginning to build a new reality, which is leaving the humans out. I do not know what that future is, but I thought as someone who has seen the richness of language, has enjoyed the timber and the tones of language, has enjoyed the poetry and the you know the the the, the, the dhun, the the kaif, the frenzy of language. I should bring this news, whether it is good or not good, to you, because if I did not do it, I would not think of myself as sufficiently human. Thank you. <laughs>